So team, it's my immense privilege to introduce the next speaker, one of the co-founders of Disciplined Agile, the creator of Agile Modeling Methods and Agile Data Methods, Vice President and Chief Scientist of Disciplined Agile at TMI, and the author of many books. Ladies and gentlemen, Scott Ambler for you. So welcome to WAVE 2020, the platform is yours now. All right, thank you uh, very much for inviting me and uh, for everybody to take time out of their, their busy days. I, I appreciate this is reasonably late at night now and um, you, know, you could be with your families, but instead you're here with me, so thank you. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is discipline res resiliency. How do, we, how do we become more effective? How do, we, how do we grow our organizations and execute in such a way that um, we could survive um, and thrive in these new environments and changing environments that we're, you know, we're, we're clearly seeing. So um, as you heard, I'm the, the VP and Chief Scientist for uh, Discipline Agile at PMI. And uh, along with Mark Lyons, I'm also one of the co-creators of it. So I'm going to share some uh, Discipline Agile strategies with you in a, in a few minutes. So um, first I want to uh, speak about you know what is what is resiliency or, and more importantly what is enterprise resiliency what you know how can we make our you know what what does it mean for our organizations to be more resilient then I'm going to jump into mindset issues so as a leader as leaders within your organization how can you you know what type of mindset do you need to well be more resilient yourself but also to grow and engender resiliency within your organization um, you know with COVID we're seeing that a lot of a lot of organizations are struggling and some will not survive and in many ways it was because they're not sufficiently resilient um, they're not <clears throat> anti-fragile um, and then I'll, I'll work through some techniques for how can we how can we as individuals and our teams choose to be more resilient and what, what techniques can we can we uh, adopt new ideas can we adopt in order to do this and then I'll, of course I'll take questions um, so enterprise resiliency is the capacity um, of an organization to recover rapidly. So things change, you know, the, the, only, the only constant, the only thing we can count on is change. Um, and certainly, you know, we've seen a significant change in the marketplace with COVID-19. Now, you know, a lot of people are trying to predict what, uh, you know, what the, the, the post-COVID environment is gonna be. Um, frankly, I think we're a long way away from post-COVID, but, uh, you know, I'd be more, a little more worried about what the COVID um, environment is gonna be. Um, and I can't tell you. Um, but I can gear, I, 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 don't t I can't tell you exactly what it's going to be like, and it'll be different for every organization anyways, but I can tell you it's going to be more competitive. And I can tell you it's going gonna, it's gonna to require greater resiliency and greater ability to adapt to change and to, to actually um, you know, maneuver about um, because your, organiza your organization is becoming more competitive, but so are your competitors. So we're, we're just ratcheting up um, you know, the complexities and the, the challenges that we face. So it's uh, it, it's going to be an interesting few years, I believe, uh, and, and probably longer than that. Um, so, um, what is resilient leadership? How you know what what is the mindset of a of a resilient leader? What can we what can we do about this? So, the um, first of all, be optimistic. You know, never give up hope. Um, the good leaders are optimistic. Um, they they realize that you know we can survive. We will survive. We we will make it through this. We. We will do better. Um, it, it, it's clear um, for, for many of us. You know, as I said, some organizations aren't going to make it, but um, many will, and they'll be better for it in the long run. So um, we need to be optimistic that we will be amongst those survivors. And better yet, maybe we can even thrive. We're in in this, the, the current environment. We are seeing some organizations just growing rapidly and, and thriving. Like you know, um, you know, Zoom and and Miro, like all these software tools for enabling remote work. All these organizations that are you know, can deliver um, food and can deliver um, items to us, so that way we don't have to go shopping. Um, they're all thriving as well. So many organizations are you know, doing better as a result of this dramatic change that we're all experiencing right now. We need to be flexible, we, even when it hurts. I, I love this picture. Um, we we need to be able to change with our environment and to. Um, and, and, and be willing, you know, be willing to change and be able to change. So flexibility is absolutely critical, um, and it's frankly always been important. But certainly now, um, with greater competition, it, it certainly is even even more critical. Um, I can't say this enough. We we need to build a, a both a diverse and a psychologically safe workplace. Um, we need to allow people to be themselves. We we and we should embrace that. We should enjoy it. 
um, you know, I, I love meeting new people. I love uh, being challenged and and having my, you know, you know being able to grow uh, myself as a person by working with other people who are very different than me. And, um, you know, frankly, that, you know, the, the strangest or the weirdest people are the are the are the, the best ones to work with, um, because you, you learn the most from them and you you typically learn some very, very um, interesting things from them and um, greater diversity, um, greater psychological safety um, enables innovation it, it enables us to react to change better, um, particularly when we have a, a new problem that we've never faced before. Um, we want a diverse group of people, um, you know, talking about that and working through it and coming up with potential solutions. So it's absolutely critical to our success. Um, as leaders, we, we need to monitor both the internal environment, you know, what the heck is going on right now in our organization, as well as our external environment. You know, what is happening? What are our competitors doing? What do our customers want? Um, in the case of government agencies, what do our citizens need and want? Um, and, and this should be as real time and as automated as possible. So, you know, data analytics and, and all these, you know, you know, big data and data analytics and all these good things, absolutely critical to your success, to your success all these automated dashboards and, and, and good, good things like that. But also, uh, more importantly, as leaders, the ability to um, understand what we're seeing, the ability to deal with ambiguity and um, be able to, you know, parse and understand and sift through um, this often overwhelming amount of information that we have available to us and to understand that. And, and you know, COVID-19 is making it clear, you know, some countries are, are better at that than others. Um, so, it, you know, I'll just leave it at that. But um, we really do, and some, some people, some organizations are, are, are better at it than others. And um, this is critical to our success and, you know, being able to understand what's going on and be able to see beyond what's going on and, you know, or see beyond the data sometimes and be able to understand, you know, the implications of what might be happening there and, and why it's important to us. Uh, so this is absolutely incredi in, uh, incredibly important um, skill for and mindset shift for many of our leaders. Um, the ability to experiment and the willingness to experiment, and I find that a lot of um, a lot of leaders can struggle with this because sometimes experiments fail. Um, but these are the ways. This is the way that we learn. At the same time, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, that um, sometimes we don't need to experiment with things. You know, they, we can learn from others. And we can stand on the shoulders of giants that came before us and people who have experienced similar problems to us in the past. Um, but at the same time, we, we definitely need to be able to be willing to try new things, to be able to give them a fair chance and then measure and determine, you know, did this new thing work for us? And if so, then adopt it. Um, and uh, I find a lot of leaders are leery about this idea of experimentation because they want certainty. They, they don't want any risk. And, and actually, the riskiest way to work is to not experiment, to not try new things, to not uh, be willing to fail and, and pick yourself up and, and continue on and um, and be willing to learn from these failures. So um, this is absolutely critical. And um, the organizations that struggle with this experimentation concept, um, they're going to be, I think they're going to be in serious trouble and they, they might be the one, you know, if I had to pick one thing, um, it might be this that um, is an indicator that they're probably not going to make it. Um, but we'll have to see, you know, we'll, we'll have greater insight a year or two from now. Um, and, and be willing to adapt. Um, you know, the, the environment is changing. You know, with greater competition um, requires us to be able to, to sense and respond better and to understand what our competitors are doing and to be able to respond to that and to, to hopefully leapfrog them. Um, so this is the, this is the, the fundamental idea here. Um, we, we must be flexible. We must be adaptable. Um, and I think the, and I think we've seen this, this is, you know, our, our in, in uh, North America, we'll say that our, our chickens have come home to roost. Um, organizations that have not invested in, in infrastructure, who uh, in particularly um, I, you know, digital infrastructure, the ones that have allowed their technical debt to increase or, or their quality to decrease um, is a better way of looking at it in, in management terms. Um, the ones that made short-term project-based decisions that then um, sacrifice the long term, like this idea that, you know, let's just, you know, let's be on time and on budget. And if we produce bad quality, that's okay, we'll clean it up later. Um, that increased technical debt, that, in, that decreased quality, um, that is, has put a lot of organizations, that, that, that attitude um, put a lot of organizations in trouble because they were, 
they had all these quality challenges that they may or may not have intended to fix at some point. Um, but then COVID hit and they had to respond quickly and they were, they were stuck in their garbage and um, they didn't have the infrastructure. And I'm sure many of you have seen memes uh, flying around the internet, but um, you know, my favorite meme about this is, you know, what is currently driving your, um, your, your, your digital transformation strategy? Is it your CEO, your CTO, or COVID-19? And in many cases, it's COVID-19 now. Uh, organizations are, you know, particularly a couple of months ago, were absolutely scrambling to get the infrastructure in place to enable remote working and to figure all these basic things out. Um, and, and many organizations are still struggling with, with fundamental infrastructure issues. Um, just because it takes time to dig your way out of this hole that you, you know, that you, you um, dug for yourself, um, you know, over the years. So um, resilient leaders, resilient organizations realize that they need to have a good, solid and flexible infrastructure in place that enables them to shift and adapt and respond to changes in the environment that they're in. So um, this is an absolutely critical thing that um, I think we're learning, the, many of us are learning the hard way now. So how can we choose to be resilient? How can we how can we choose our wow, choose our way of working, so that way um, we are more resilient on our projects, we're more resilient uh, in our organizations as well. So, and in many ways, this is um, at the heart of of discipline agile. It's certainly absolutely critical for us. So um, one of the one of the things that I, I constantly advise people is enable your teams to choose a way of working that makes the most sense for them. It's not, you know, one size does not fit all. Um, small teams work differently than large teams. A team in a regulatory, life, life critical regulatory environment will work very differently in a team than a team that has no regulatory concerns at all. A team that's taking on a very complex problem will work much differently than a team that's taking on a very simple problem. A team that is um, working at you know, different locations around the globe will work much differently than a team uh, that, that's reasonably co-located, for example. Um, teams that, you know, a project team will work differently than a non-project team, a, a long-standing team. Um, so as a result, um, it's, and these, these are easy things to, to, to choose to observe if you want. Um, so allow teams to do the best they can in the situation that they face. Um, this increases your chance of success. Why would you want to do this? It, it also increases the complexity of leadership um, and governance for you. Um, we'll talk about that in a bit, but um, certainly um, much better for the teams. And so in Dispen Agile, um, as a result, we support, uh, we enable teams to follow different ways of working. So for example, we have um, Agile, uh, a Scrum-based Agile project life cycles. We also have a Scrum-based Agile continuous delivery or um, you know, long-standing product team um, or dedicated uh, product team type of a life cycle, more of a DevOps type of an approach. Um, similarly, we have lean and, and you know, lean project um, life cycle and a lean uh, approach to continuous delivery. We also have a, a lean startup, you know, um, exploratory life cycle based on, well, based on lean startup and uh, complexity theory. And you know, how, do you, how do you explore a new product idea? How do you explore a new idea for a service um, to bring to market? How do you actually learn about what your customers actually want and need? Um, and that's a much different way than taking a project-based approach. And of course, a, a program. So how do we do a, you know, a team of teams or a team of projects, um, depending on how you want to define that. Um, I, I prefer team of teams because not all teams are doing projects, but um, certainly, um, you know, how do we, how do we a larger team of teams? So like, you know, the, what SAFE and LESS and, and other frameworks um, t take on. Um, and not, not, all, not all things are, are pro programs, of course, we know this. Um, many, most organizations might have one or two large programs, fair enough, but they've got a heck of a lot of small endeavors um, that need very different life cycles than what, than what would be appropriate for a program, and that's okay. So different teams in different situations will work in different ways and should be allowed to, and better yet, enabled and, and governed in such a way so that they can. Um, this is what will, you know, this supports resiliency. It just supports effectiveness in general, but certainly supports uh, resiliency. Um, we also want to, to build a, a network of semi-autonomous self-organizing teams. This is, um, you know, if you're familiar with the work of Steve Denning, he talks about the, you know, the three laws of Agile, and, and one of them is the, the law of the network that, that we have, that our organizations are a, are a network of interacting teams, or, and, and our organization might be part of an overall um, network of organizations as well, if you, if you look at it from the environmental ecosystem point of view. Um, but the idea is that each of these teams will be working in their own unique way. 
each because they have different goals. They're different people. They have different goals, different aims. They they face different situations, uh, and that's okay. Um, the the implication is that we need to enable them to do that, but as well, we need to enable them to collaborate effectively. So where most agilists talk about autonomous teams, um, that, that's observably not true. Um, the vast majority of teams have to interact with somebody else to get the job done. My team has to you know, work with the financial people, for example, to get money to fund the effort. Um, this is easy to observe if you choose to. So at best, these, these teams are semi-autonomous and that's okay. We, we still want them to you know, be as autonomous as you can, but recognize you have to collaborate with others, but also enable those teams to be self-organizing, allow them to figure out how they're gonna to work together, allow them to figure out their process and help them and guide them doing that, of course, but allow them to be as effective as they can. Um, and, and frankly, get out of their way when you have to, most of the time you gotta just get out of their way, let them, let, let them get on with their job and provide guidance and, and oversight, but that's about it. So um, we can be a lot smarter about the way that we organize and lead and govern if we, if we choose to. And, and the, the modern environment requires us to do that. Um, we also want to be building a, an agile enterprise. So Dispin Agile is, is actually a toolkit that enables organizations to become agile enterprises, or you know, it enables business agility, to, depending on your terminology. So we've organized the toolkit into four layers. The first is a foundational layer. And, I want to point out that the Dis Dispin Agile is a hybrid. Um, so we adopt great ideas from Agile and Lean, of course, but also from the traditional world, the, the serial world. Um, because sometimes, you know, we heard from the previous speaker, sometimes, you know, more traditional ways of working make sense. Um, I would argue, and, and my, and, you know, having gone around the world and worked for many organizations over the years and in, very, in many, many different situations, I have never, ever seen a team, including a construction team, by the way, that couldn't couldn't be more agile, couldn't be more effective in the way that they work. Um, but there's limits, of course, right? There's you know when you're when you're building a bridge or you're you're building a, a soccer stadium or a, or a house, um, there's limits to to the agility. But um, I put my I'm a firm believer in putting my money where my mouth is. I recently built a house in a hybrid agile man, or I had a house built. I didn't build it myself, but you know um, I had the, a house built um, in an in an in an agile hybrid manner. Um, because the, the, the traditional stuff fell apart on us and we had to become more agile in order, in order to get the job done. So, um, yeah, so, anyway, so the, the, the foundational layer is, um, you know, provides the foundation, you know, provides the foundation for the toolkit and it's a hybrid is what I'm getting at. Um, so a lot of great, great ideas there. Um, the next step up or the, you know, one layer is what we call discipline DevOps. This is, um, DevOps for the enterprise. So, and, and even in a physical construction firm, there's still IT going on. Um, maybe not a lot, but um, there's still IT going on. So, and you've still got some IT projects. So um, keep this in mind. So anyway, so having a, and we're looking at things from an organizational point of view right now, but keep in mind that the vast majority of, of projects have some sort of an IT component um, to them. That's fine. So um, recognize that you might want to be good at that. And this is what Discipline DevOps is all about. And it's basically table stakes. It's not agile software development anymore. It's really DevOps. And how do you do that with security in mind, and data, data stuff in mind, and, and many other absolutely critical aspects of DevOps. And, and so we address that in DA and, and look at it from an enterprise class view, as opposed to a team-based view that you know, most of the, you know, a lot of people focus on DevOps. Um, so then building upon that are value streams. So how do we, how do we bring products and services to market? How do we delight our customers? Um, how do, and we'll, we'll see some workflow for that in a second, but how do we actually be successful at doing that? And, and this has nothing to do, potentially nothing to do with IT, right? So if you're, if you're a company that builds houses or builds buildings, you still need to delight your customers. Your, your product in this case might be a building and maybe even the operations of that building at some point. Um, but that's your product and service that you're, you're bringing to market and you might want to delight your customers because if you don't, somebody else will and they'll steal that customer away from you and you've got a problem. So your value stream is in delivering buildings to customers on a, you know, appropriate basis. And then of course, how does the rest of the enterprise work? So how can we improve our approach to finance? How can we improve our approach to vendor management and procurement or, you know, legal or, or HR people management stuff? Um, because all those, all those groups, all those areas within your organization can improve. They can get better if you choose to, and they need to. Um, you know, many, any, many organizations struggle with Agile because they perceive Agile as only being about software development 
and they don't realize that, well, wait a minute, no, we can, we can apply agile strategies and lean strategies and, and other strategies, of course, um, to improve across the board, um, not just in software. So I think this, is a, um, um, this will be a, a, a big mindset change in general for, uh, for the project management community, well, the entire community, let alone the project management community. So um, keep this in mind. Um, this is the, um, the life cycle or the workflow for, uh, for value streams, the D, uh, Discipline Agile Flex in this case. So we want to provide measurable value to our customers. Um, one of the interesting uh, concepts in DA that we promote is the, um, you, don't, you don't produce value until something is in the, in the hands of the customer and actually gives them value, and hopefully measurable value, but um, certainly value. So it's not until you realize value that you achieve value. So um, this earned value management stuff really isn't about earn, earning value, but because um, you don't have value, you don't, you, there's zero value until it's in the hands of the customer and it, and it could be an internal customer to your, to your organization, but it's in the hands of the customer and then they are doing whatever it is that they do to achieve value from this product, this service, this offering that you provide them. So um, so the a value stream begins and ends with the customer and continues on. So it doesn't really end, hopefully, because I hope you're successful. Um, and there's many aspects of this and how does it all fit together? So is this one large team that's working, you know, you know, providing this value stream? Is it a collection of teams collaborating effectively and therefore we have to attend to relationships across these teams? Um, you know, it depends on your situation, of course, but um, the overall idea is that all these aspects need to be need to be working together effectively and need to be constantly tuning and tweaking and and improving. So particularly if it's a collection of teams, I would I, I would honestly expect all those teams to be constantly learning, constantly improving um, within their team with the implication that um, the way that they, they collaborate with other teams will also um, change over time as you know, as these teams that are collaborating improve what they're doing and improve and, and learn and, and get better over time. Um, so how do we do this? So um, the how do organizations become really effective? And if, if we look at the organizations that are that have been you know doing well over the last decade or two or the, the organizations that we admire or, or fear in some cases, who are they? Well, it's the Amazons of the world, the Googles of the world, the Ebays of the world, PayPal, Spotify, um, those are really, they're awesome organizations. They're scary to have to compete against. Well, how the heck did they get so scary? There's nothing special about Amazon. There's nothing special about eBay um, other than they chose to get really good. That was it. They chose to be better. They chose to improve. And how did they do that? Did they adopt some framework like Scrum or Save for Less? No. Heck no. They would laugh at you to, if, if you even suggested that. They can't be limited, um, that limited. Um, what they have done instead is they've adopted a, a strategy called Kaizen, Continuous Improvement. Um, and there's like many different flavors of it, PDSA and PDCA, and, and, all, and, and they're all good. Um, but the idea is you improve in small steps and you just constantly do this. And then over time, and because you're improving a small step, a small step, a small step, um, it adds up over time. So you get all these small little improvements that um, add up to a really big um, process improvement over time. So how do they do this? Well, how does it work? Well, you know, you, you can read this chart. It's it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, you've got you've got some sort of issue. You identify something you want to improve or some problem that you're facing. You um, somehow identify you know one or more ways that we could potentially uh, improve on that problem or you know improve the situation. We try them out, and we also determine how we're going to measure, how we're going to detect that we've actually improved, and we try them out. We give them a, give them a fair chance. Then we assess, hey, did this work or not? And if it worked, we adopt the technique. If it didn't work, we, we abandon it. It just doesn't work for us for now, and that's okay. Um, and if we're polite, we share our learnings with others, so that way um, others can take advantage of you know, what we just learned. So this strategy ha enables you know, the Amazons, the Ebays of the world to get better, and they've, they've got a proven track record of doing this. And they've been doing it for so long, this is why they're so far ahead of us. Um, well, you can do that too you can actually be better at this, right? Because, you know, we've got an issue of, well, how the heck do we catch up to Amazon if they're so far ahead of us because they've been doing this for 15 or 20 years? How the heck do we catch up? Um, can we do better than Amazon? Might be a, an interesting question to ask yourself. Um, so, okay, this is what we've, this is the questions that I've been you know, working on for a few years now. Um, so, yes, so the observation is that when you try techniques, you're only human. 
sometimes your experiments fail, and that's okay, right? And there's lots of you know lots of rhetoric, you know, particularly coming out of the Agile consultants. Well, it's not really a failure because you've learned something and and all and all that. And, and okay, yes, you have, but you know what? If if you're the one that's paying for these experiments and a lot of them are failing, um, that you know that rhetoric you know wears thin pretty fast. Um, so can we do better? And of course, you know the you know the, the other rhetoric coming out of the Agile community the last few years is well. You know, we get good at failing fast, so it's not too expensive. And certainly failing fast is better than failing slowly. So, you know, I'll give them that, but it's still failing. So what happens, you know, if we could succeed more often, if we could su succeed earlier, we would improve faster. First of all, fewer failures will mean more successes, um, but it also means that we're improving faster and the cost of, impro of improvement decreases as a result because we, you know, we have fewer failures, we have fewer losses, um, in these experiments. So it's cheaper and it's faster. So not, not so bad. So how do we do that? So um, the issue is around the previous step. If we can get better at identifying potential things to experiment with, um, if we can get better at identifying things that, hey, this is more than likely going to work in our situation, and our situation is unfortunately unique, um, if, but if we can get better at guessing, then um, we can, we will actually have fewer failures. We'll have more successes. So we improve faster. So how do you do that? Well, you can hire an expensive coach, um, which is fine. I'm a firm believer in coaching. Um, you, you really do want people who have been there, done that, and then can help you to improve. This is a, a very good thing to do. Um, but good coaches are hard to find and they're expensive and they, they can be hard to keep. So, and can you even identify a good coach? Uh, that's, yeah, that's another interesting challenge. But anyways, if you can get good coaches, fine. Um, please do so. Um, but also, um, if you've got a, a, some sort of process knowledge base, if you know what your options are, if you know how to choose between them, if you know what the trade-offs are, then you can make better choices. You can make better decisions. And particularly if you've got a coach with access to such a knowledge base, because they'd probably be better at navigating it than you, um, then that's probably a good thing. So this is what we call guided continuous improvement. So let's walk through an example. So, uh, you know, so why is this important? Okay, sorry, I'll walk through an example in a minute. Um, so why is this important? Well, the Amazons of the world, you know, enjoy this sort of an improvement curve. And, and this is well documented. Um, they've been doing this for years. And to be fair, this is like a jagged curve because you've got some failures, so it goes down a bit and then some successes, so it goes up. But over time, it's generally a positive trend where we're just, you know, you know, we're just getting better over time. And like I said, they've been doing it for so long, they're, they're amazing now. Um, with guided continuous improvement, because we have fewer failures, you improve faster. It's basic math, it's, it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. So let's walk through an example. So here we've got, you know, we're in this scenario, we've got this existing team, we've got a product we've taken to market, everybody, you know, our existing customers are happy, but we're not growing the marketplace. For whatever, you know, we don't understand what potential customers would want. We've got a good handle on our existing customers, don't really know what new customers would want. So we're not growing. So that's the problem. So team gets together, we talk about it. Somebody says, hey, why don't we adopt the exploratory life cycle? This is really good. You know, we can do, uh, you know, lean startup, a hypothesis driven approach, build our resumes, all the good sort of stuff, we'll run experiments. We'll do MVPs, minimum viable products, you know, build our resumes, yay, yay, yay. All good stuff. Well, yeah, that, that's that's a strategy, and, and and it's an option, definitely, but probably overkill. So, are there better options? So, because we know how to navigate the the toolkit, and it, yes, it takes a little bit of skill, a couple of days of training, all this sort of stuff. Um, but because we know know how to navigate the toolkit, we realize, you know what? Um, we've really got a challenge with the way we explore scope. We don't really understand how our stakeholder, how our potential new customers want to explore, how, want to use our product. We don't know understand. We don't know what their usage would be. So hey, that's a scoping problem. So let's dive down into some details. And we we look at this is this is something called a goal diagram. And the idea here is when we're exploring scope, we have a collection of, of decisions that we need to make. We have some in, intents that we need to fulfill. So um, and we will do this implicitly, at least implicitly. Um, my advice is to do it explicitly. Think for yourself. So think. Um, and so what you need to think about is the question that we're answering in DA. 
So when we're exploring scope, well, we, we have certain intentions that we need to fulfill. Um, you know, how are we going to explore usage? How are we going to explore the data needs of our, of our customers? How are we going to explore the, pro the, the business process? And this is true of a, bit of a bridge, right? Now, how are cars going to go over this bridge? And what's the flow? Like, there's, you know, same basic concepts, even though um, a little bit of software focus here. Um, this could be a bridge. This could be a house that are, you know, a collection of houses that we're building here. Same basic idea. Um, you know, explore your quality requirements. How do we go about gathering the requirements? How do we go about documenting the requirements, if at all? Um, you know, because if you're in a regulatory situation, it's a much different answer than if you're in a non-regulatory situation. So we look at this chart and we realize that, and, you know, hopefully we've seen this before, but we look at this going, oh, you know what? It looks like we have a, an issue with the way we explore usage. And if I, I, if I look at that list of um, things in exploring usage, my team is currently doing epics and user stories because that's what we learned about in our, our Scrum certification course. But there's other techniques there that we're not familiar with. Um, and maybe our coaches, maybe maybe we don't even have a coach, but um, we're not familiar with all these techniques. You know what, we're just, we're not requirements experts on our team. We're not process experts on our team. And we're certainly not requirements experts in this case. So we do a little bit of reading and we look in the toolkit and we go, oh yeah, these are, you know, here's what these techni techniques are, which I've never heard of before. And we look at them and, and one of them, oh, look, a persona. That looks like a technique, sounds like it's a technique that might work. And so here we've got a brief description of persona is. Um, in many cases, there's links to more, like references to more details. So um, in this case, this is the phys, uh, you know, printout of the physical Choose Your Wild book. Um, if you're a DA member, this is a, 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 you could use the digital tool online, which is the same information. Uh, but in this case, you know, we've got a, a chart from the book. Um, but anyway, so we look at the we look at this description of persona. Hmm, that sounds like it's going to work for us. And more importantly, we know what the trade-offs are, because there's no such thing as a best practice. Never has been, never will be. No such thing as a worst practice either. All practices have strengths and weaknesses. They make sense in some situations and not in others. That's why there's some failures. Um, that's why when you try a technique, sometimes it doesn't work out for you. Maybe it's a great technique, but just not for you in your situation, for whatever reason. Um, so what we want to do, though, as I said before, is we want to increase the chance of us identifying a strategy that we can experiment with in our situation in order to hopefully improve the way that we're working and solve whatever problem we currently solve. Um, so this is, um, this is what's called guided continuous improvement, and it, it, it basically show and the idea is use the DA toolkit in order to make better decisions. That's what it gets down to. Um, so as a result, you know, whatever your current way of working is, um, you can start improving from there. So if you're currently doing traditional stuff, great, that's where you're starting. If you're currently doing, if you're currently a scrum organization or a safe organization or a safe team, as the case may be, great, that's what you're doing. That's your current way of working. We can help you to improve um, out of that with DA. So start where you are, um, do, the, do the best that you can in the situation that you face and always strive to get better. So where many of the frameworks, you know, they wave their hands and they tell you oh, it's the art of the possible and you can, you can tailor the, the framework to, to meet the needs of your situation, they, they typically don't give you any advice to, ha to, to do that. And they certainly don't give you any advice to how do you move away from using this, this framework. Um, why would they? That doesn't make any sense, right? So in DA, we say, well, these are the skills you need in order to imp actually improve from wherever you are. Um, these, these are the skill. And then, you know, if you, you know, you start with scrum and you move away from that, great. If you start with something else and you move towards scrum, great. You know, whatever makes sense for you. I, I don't know what makes sense for you, um, but I can help you to get better, right? I can, I can teach you the skills to get better. Um, and that's what DA is all about. And this is what enables us to become more resilient, uh, because if we've got the ability to under, to identify challenges and identify these problems and then react according, adapt our way of working. Um, that enables that engenders resiliency, and that enables us to survive and hopefully even thrive in whatever situations that we face. So thank you very much. I'm uh, happy to take to take questions now. Um, so go ahead. Scott, thank you very much. Because even though we have uh, like listened or heard about disciplined agile, you have very beautifully put forward from the beginning, like in the current COVID situation, how as an organization we can be resilient and we can never give up hope, how to focus on what, what the team approaches, what the team, how it should be 
so that it makes sense for the team and the importance of guided continuous improvement. It is really interesting. So we have two questions for you. Uh, the first one is, is guided continuous improvement yet another agile project? Um, well, it's not a project. It's it's more of a strategy or a technique. Um, so it's a technique that you can you can apply in any situation. Like I just I went through one example of a of a team you know with a pro, you know challenge understanding potential customers, but you know I could have yeah you know, I, I could very easily we could have gone through another example of hey our team is now being forced to work remotely. What the heck do we do? Um, so you know or or you know the problem of hey our team has to understand has to do. Some initial requirements modeling up front, but we're working remotely. What the heck do we do? Because I'm used to going in and you know and, and doing whiteboard stuff, and we can't do that anymore. So what do we do? Um, so that you know, so regard you know, so whatever what are the the idea is that you've got a problem, and if you know how to navigate the toolkit, then you can identify potential strategies for addressing that problem, and then hopefully you know try them out and see if it actually works for you. Thank you. And uh, we have one more question. In agile development environment, is it beneficial to invest in long-term infrastructure? Yes, uh, absolutely. You, you'd be foolish not to. And the so and if that requires a different mindset and different set of skills. Um, and, and that of course assumes that you know you have a vision that your organization is going to stick around for a long time. You know, if you're a, like a pop-up type of a thing and you, you're only going to be in business for six months. Then yeah, yeah, you don't need much infrastructure. But if your vision is that you're you're going to last as an organization, then yes, you absolutely need infrastructure. And the agilists um, constantly talk about infrastructure. Every time an agilist talks about automating something, they're building infrastructure, fundamentally, right? Um, as soon as they start talking about paying down technical debt or not creating technical debt to begin with, that's an infrastructure discussion. So um, yeah, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, so thank you very much, Scott. You have rightly answered every question. So, um, and thank you. Please accept our green as a token of our appreciation. Thank you. Uh, and we would also like to thank you for your contribution to Udan program by participating in our program. So just to uh, give you an insight on what the, this green is, uh, it is part of a project called Sankalp Saru wherein in your name, uh, trees will be planted and you can bet will uh, check, the, check the growth of the tree, how much it is progressing by just checking the code. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.